Hello everyone. So my movie, The Sudbury Devil, premiered at the Satanic Temple World Headquarters in Salem, Massachusetts this past Saturday. Uh, thanks so much to our generous hosts at TST and of course to everybody who came out to see the film. We are organizing an independent roadshow trying to bring this movie to art house theaters all over the world. So please keep your eyes peeled on the Atunche Films community tab here on YouTube or the various Atunche social media pages for updates on potential screenings in your area. Now this is a movie. Uh, it is meant to be seen on the big screen with a bunch of deranged, you know, Witchfinder General fans hooting and hollering at the screen. But at the same time, this is playing only in a very limited number of cinemas. So I know most of you are thinking, well, you know, that's all well and good if you live in those few cities, but when is it coming to streaming? While we're still entertaining offers for long-term, wide-scale streaming distribution, I'm excited to announce that the movie will be available to stream early on this Sunday, September 17th at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, uh, courtesy of our friends and premier hosts at the Satanic Temple on their online media platform, TST TV. Basically, you just buy a ticket, you log on when the movie's about to begin, and enjoy. And the cool thing about this particular streaming event is that there's a chat. So basically, you can participate and talk to people and, and hurl insults and abuse as the film goes on. You can do it live. And uh, myself and hopefully some cast and crew members also will be in the chat answering questions as the film goes on. So yeah, should be pretty fun. Anyway, links in the description. So way back in 2020, uh, right before the plague hit, I made a video announcing that I was going to make this film. And one of my selling points was that I was going to try to make this as historically accurate as possible uh, given the limitations of our modest budget. So how did I do? Well, I, I, I'm pretty biased, but uh, I think pretty damn well. Me and my team knew that we didn't have enough money to make every stitch of every piece of clothing and every detail of every prop 100% accurate. But a good script costs nothing. And it was very important to me that we create a truthful, believable, kind of lived-in portrait of late 17th century Massachusetts. So today I'm going to show you five clips from the Sudbury Devil and break down some of the history behind them. Sudbury Town is small. Unlike Boston with its tavern rakes about all hours, street lamps and every corner, moonlight on the arbor, no. Night falls hard here, sirs. And with it comes a most dreadful dark in the most heavy silence. It was in that darkness and that silence that I saw it. Saw so what? A spirit. It came in the form of light. Purer than fire. Whiter. It moved with such grace, such smartness. It blinded me. I stood there, rooted to the spot. It was there, and then... It was gone. So this scene comes at the beginning of the film, and it's the inciting incident that sends our erstwhile witch hunters, Josiah Cutting and John Fletcher, on a fateful investigation of these strange happenings. There's a lot of theological significance to a demonic entity taking this sort of angelic form. Uh, in Christian mythology, of course, Satan himself is, you know, the morning star, the day star, you know, the, the, uh, the, the light bringer. And there's this idea in the elaborated theory of witchcraft that Satan can kind of revert back to his angelic form in order to tempt and trick potential minions. A passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 11 comes to mind. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Famously, during the Salem Witch Trials, the minister George Burroughs was uh, about to be hanged with the noose around his neck and uh, recited the Lord's Prayer in its entirety, which moved a lot of the onlookers to tears and empathy and common sense dangerously intruded on everybody's hysteria for a moment uh, until Cotton Mather, the, the famous uh, theologian and minister, came forward and recited this same passage from 2 Corinthians. Satan, uh, you know, can take the form of an angel of light. And, uh, and Burroughs was hanged. So, um, you know, yeah, there's, there's good old Cotton Mather doing his thing. Within the context of the film, there are very much a lot of these characters who 
uh, present themselves as you know these good, honest, upstanding Christian men, but who are not nearly as virtuous as uh, they present themselves. And historically, in terms of the demonology of the witch hunters, you could kind of see this idea of Satan as an angel of light being a bit of a self-report in a way, right? Because these guys are going around Europe murdering women by the thousands, but no, 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 it's the witches who are wolves in sheep's clothing. What came still by this wound? Damn the heathens. They're in the war. Ah. Uh, where? Here. In the Sudbury fight. Savages beset the town. Militia was not to be found all morning. We was forced to take up arms for the defense. Bloody brook. I thought the nipmuck. The savage took me away. But I took his life. Well, King Philip and his confederates are in L. I thank God every day for that. So the Sudbury Devil takes place in 1678, two years after the end of King Philip's War, and it is a huge part of the story. Uh, it's this powerful, traumatic experience that all of the characters share and, and were, in some sense, shaped by. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of them have been visibly, physically maimed by it. Like, Fletcher is missing an eye, uh, uh, Good Now, that guy he was talking to, is missing an arm, and Cutting has a limp, uh, although he wasn't actually written that way. Josh, the actor who plays him, uh, fucked up his ankle the week before the shoot, and, and we just kind of rolled with it. Uh, but uh, So it was a happy accident, though not really for Josh. The way that Goodenow describes the Sudbury fight going down is, is very true to the history, and uh, even the character's name is a bit of a deep cut, because the Goodenows were one of Sudbury's founding families and maintained a garrison house that, uh, was, that played a key role in the battle when Native American forces attacked Sudbury in April of 1676. It's mentioned several times in the film that uh, Fletcher served in the company of Captain Samuel Mosley, which, if you've uh, paid attention to my King Philip's War videos, um, so he's like treated as a war hero throughout most of the film, and um, you know, if you know much about Mosley, then uh, you'll know that there's some incongruity there. So this next scene occurs after Fletcher and Cutting come across this very weird, seemingly mad lady in the woods, played by the very talented Kendra Unique, who you might know from Frozen 50s Man, and they take her captive and interrogate her to see if she's at all connected with the weird shit that's been going on in the woods. I once knew a negro man from Virginia who played on a thurible, and I hath heard tell of Portuguese negroes who play at rapier and dagger very skillfully. I do not believe it. There's a mark set upon that paper. My rule is a general, but hath its exception. We hath both known clever Indians. True. They are clever. And their falseness. And their mischief. Athens of any shade are incapable of creation. They carve faces from wood. Whilst we straddle the ocean, spreading the knowledge of Christ, pursuing the devil to his old fast at the end of the world. So this is what we in the cast and crew uh, unaffectionately call the Our Black People People scene, which is very true to English attitudes at the time. In fact, uh, most of the dialogue in this scene is taken word for word from this book, A True and Exact History of the Island of Barbados, written in 1657 by Richard Lygen, a, a uh, Englishman who visited Barbados in the 1640s and wrote an extensive account about life on the island. Lygen describes witnessing a black guy playing the theorbo, which is kind of like a big lute, and some Portuguese-speaking black men fencing with rapier and dagger. Now, of course, Black people were very much a novelty to 17th century English people, and they didn't quite know what to make of them yet. Uh, slavery was widespread all across the uh, Americas at that time, African slavery specifically, uh, even in Massachusetts. But white supremacy as like a scientific, religious, and ideological philosophy hadn't quite coalesced yet. The modern social construct of race, of course, having formed to provide a cogent justification for the predatory exploitation of slavery and colonialism, basically like a cognitive defense mechanism. 
intellectualizing the cruelty made it less horrifying. Though Lijin was certainly no abolitionist, uh, he, after spending some time in Barbados, he came to the more moderate conclusion that Fletcher comes to in the scene, which is that maybe black people are people. As he writes, Though there be a mark set upon these people, which will hardly ever be wiped off, as of their cruelties when they had advantages, and of their fearfulness and falseness, yet no rule so general but hath his exception. For I believe, and I have strong motives to cause me to be of that persuasion, that there are as honest, faithful, and conscionable people amongst them as amongst those of Europe or any other part of the world." How nice. Another little thing I took from Lijin was a phrase that Kendra's character keeps repeating over and over, which is, No more love love! Speak sense! No more love love! No! No more love love, which uh, seems like a nonsense phrase, but uh, considering that Flora hails from Barbados herself, it gives us a clue into her personal history. As Lijun writes, We have a way to feed our Christian servants with maize, which is by pounding it in a large mortar and boiling it in water to the thickness of frumenti, which is a kind of porridge, and so put in a tray such a quantity as will serve a mess of seven or eight people. Give it them cold and scarce afford them salt with it. This we call loblolly. But the Negroes, when they come to be fed with this, are much discontented and cry out, Oh, oh, no more lub lub. So these next two clips are kind of spoilery. Uh, they don't give any like major twists away or anything, but if you want to go into the movie more or less blind, then I would recommend skipping to the time code on your screen. Come, come, my royal ramping boys, let's never be cast down. We'll never mind the female toys, but loyal be to the crown. We'll never break our hearts with care or be cast Good down with fear. Our bellies then let us prepare to drink some Christmas Good beer. Now! <laughs> Happy Christmas to both of you. Pray they press a circle off. Tis within my power. But what will you give me in exchange? Me gratitude. Tut tut. Twill not do. Bring me a stick of stubble, a quart of rage, and twelve summer nights soaked in moonshine. And then I might consider it. Thou art bewitched, and mad besides. In this scene, Goodnow is seemingly under the sway of some satanical power that is driving him to sing a Christmas song. Famously, the Puritans outlawed Christmas, and there are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, the first was that there's no biblical basis for the holiday. Uh, they correctly surmised that Jesus probably wasn't born on December 25th. And second, and perhaps more understandably from a modern perspective, uh, you know, Christmas could just get out of fucking hand, man. Um, it was very different back in the 17th century than it is today. It was a drunken, chaotic affair. There are accounts of, uh, of revelers barging into people's homes and stealing their shit and vandalizing their houses. Not saying that they, like, should have banned Christmas, but I am saying, you know, they had their reasons. And in later verses, we see how this song would have been extra offensive to the Puritans. Then here's a health to Charles, our king, throughout the world admired. Let us his great applauses sing that we so much desired, and wished amongst us for to reign when Oliver ruled here. But since he's home returned again, let's fill some Christmas beer. Cringe copter, as the kids say. Major yikes. What is this monarchist? royalist cavalier claptrap. Ultra problematic. The song is celebrating the restoration of Charles II to the English throne after the death of Oliver Cromwell and the downfall of the Puritan protectorate. Uh, so, uh, and Charles II re-legalized Christmas upon his return to power. So not only is this a Christmas song, it's a royalist Christmas song, and not only that, a royalist Christmas song mocking Puritans specifically. Matt Van Gessel, the actor who plays Goodnow, helped me pick out this song. And uh, at one point he asked me, you know, is it like actually Christmas uh, in the film? And I said, no, uh, it's like April or something. Goodnow's just fucking crazy. Mr. Gavitt, wilt thou say grace? Oh, certainly. I would be honored. Bless, O oh Father, your gifts to our service and us to your use. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Your gifts that are used in us to your service. Thou hast jumbled the grace. Have I? Oh, I'm begging thy pardon, Reverend. Tis no matter. Our march was long. 
And I'm sick of that. As I said, tis no matter. So at one point in the film, Fletcher finds himself camping in the woods with these two guys, and uh, one of them, the handsome devil in red, uh, gets the words of a prayer mixed up. Witch hunters often claimed that uh, a good way to tell if somebody was a witch would be to uh, force them to recite prayers or biblical passages from memory. Uh, and if they couldn't do it, well, then that might indicate some demonic influence. Uh, never mind the fact that it might be slightly difficult to recite even well-known prayers from memory uh, under that kind of pressure when your life literally fucking depended on it. So uh, without giving too much away, it, uh, it, it, it might be a good indication in this scene that the creepy guy wearing a coat the color of blood who looks like Dracula might actually be a bad guy. So in this scene, I ripped off something that Mary Heron did in her film American Psycho, in that scene where the detective played by Willem Dafoe goes to interview Patrick Bateman uh, about the killing of Paul Allen. And uh, she had Dafoe play the scene two different ways. Uh, she did one series of takes where uh, it was just a friendly interview, a routine thing. He didn't suspect Bateman of anything. And then another series of takes where he was 100% sure that Bateman was the killer. And uh, the result, when she cut those different scenes together, and those different energies together, is really disconcerting and, and off-putting and creepy. So that's what I did. I, 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 I did some takes where I was just this, like, nice, honest Christian man who had just, you know, made this, uh, made this error and misspoke. And then uh, other uh, takes where I was just obviously comically evil. Uh, <laughs> there are many, many, many more historical deep cuts in this film. Uh, I'm sure this video could be as long as the movie itself, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, if you have seen the film, leave a comment down below letting everybody know what you, what you thought of it. Uh, or better yet, you know, write a fucking review on your blog or, you know, on your public social media platform of your choice. Help get the word out. Did you think it fucking sucked? Uh, great. Uh, make a YouTube video diving deep on why you thought it fucking sucked. The more people talking about and seeing this film, the better. All right. Till next time.